Great. Thank you so much, Pete. Um, it's always a pleasure uh, to meet with you and, and Mark and just to be with you today. I, I'm just interested because as um, Mark asked, many of you have put in words um, that you think of when you think hear the word conflict, um, you know, in terms of, of, of anger, of fear, of withdrawal, there's so many words in there. Some of them are quite emotional. Some of them are, are words um, where we see uh, sort of violence to interrupt, whether it's in, um, verbal or, or division. And, and I think it's such a perfect timing to talk with a group that is focused on, on, on unity. And Place for Hope, and I'm the director for Place for Hope, um, is an organisation that was set up to journey with individuals and faith communities who are struggling, as most of us do, uh, with uh, conflict in relationships and how that can actually uh, harm us as individuals, but also harm our ministry as a collective, as our church communities. And so what I'd like to do today is like a dipping a tip, a toe in the ocean a little bit, but I hope that that uh, what we'll cover in the next two things will just be something that you can glimpse. Yeah, that that would, it really helps to have that sort of um, viewpoint. So let me just share my screen. And at the end, we'll have some opportunity for questions. So I'm just going to. So. All those things that you just popped in the chat are very normal things that we think about when we think about conflict. But here at Place for Hope, we have a little bit of a different view, and I'd like to introduce you to that. And so we have a definition that we share with people, um, and it can seem a little bit bland in some ways, but let me give me a moment. Two or more individuals or groups with incompatible or seemingly incompatible goals. Now, those goals can be the ways that we do things, what we're aiming for, our theology, um, uh, the, uh, the types of sacraments that we consider have to be part of our worship. It could be a whole range of things. Or we can have the same goal, but different ways of getting there. So we may want to grow um, uh, followers of Christ in our church, but we may have two very different ways of, of wanting to achieve that. And, and they may be incompatible or seemingly incompatible. So when we think of that as a definition, that we can see that conflict itself is neither good nor bad. Um, in fact, it's, it's a sign of, of diversity and how rich we are to have different ex life experiences, different ways of thinking about things, different uh, encounters with God that all play into um, us having uh, different ways of wanting to do things or different ways of thinking or believing. So given that type of definition, we can see that conflict has within it an opportunity or risk. So Although conflict itself is neutral, if we don't manage it well, it can have a risk of violence. Now, when I'm talking about violence, I'm not just talking about direct violence. I'm talking about anything that diminishes or demeans us as individuals who are created in the image of God. So it could be the way we think about or other people. Um, it can be in the way we speak to one another. It can be in the structures that we set up that may discriminate against um, some people over others, or it may be direct violence. It may be the, the shouting or the division that we end up with. But we also have that opportunity. And in terms of opportunity, conflict can be at, at, its, at its lowest most point, and we're going to explore those in a moment, a window to growing peace. And I mean here the shalom type of peace, where there is wholeness, there is, there is a... a the brokenness and division that is happening between people and relationships is healed. There is an opportunity in every conflict at its lowest level to deepen our understanding of one another and to deepen our relationship and community. Now that all sounds very, <laughs> very nice and, and uh, lovely. Uh, but the reality is that when we're in the middle of a, um, an escalated conflict with all the emotions that we can have, it can seem like it's really hard to step back and see how we can turn this into an opportunity for growth, for transformation of ourselves and our relationships. 
And the very first step we do at Place for Hope when we work with groups, because we go out to do not only training, but we do coaching and we do mediation interventions with whole congregations sometimes, is that we, we talk to people about where they are in a conflict. And for us to understand that, we look at how conflict escalates. And so I'm going to work us through this and then we're going to stop and have a, have a chat. So Speed Lees is a, is a real name of a real person who lives in the States and has done um, conflict work around the world. Um, and what he noticed after decades is that there are quite a lot of patterns of how conflict escalates. And he's put this down in this, this model. His first level, that bottommost level, and if you think about our definition I just gave you before about incompatible or seemingly incompatible goals or strategies it's this lowest level a problem to solve is what speed lees calls it sometimes i like to think of it as we have a different way of seeing things so we have different ways of seeing things theologically politically uh, in the ways that we like to do things the ways that we like to communicate so the problem to solve here is is that level now, for those of you more like myself, visually, <laughs> uh, visual learners, I like a little picture. So we have our two parties. Now, the two parties, A and B, can be individuals or groups. And at this level, they're focused on that, in, that rectangle in the middle where they are looking at things differently. They have different ideas, different ways of doing things, different ways of thinking or believing. And to find a way forward to the future, they, they are very focused on finding a solution, a resolution to it. How can we, given our different ways of thinking or believing or doing, can we move forward that we are both happy with? So they're focused on the solution. And the language at this level is very much affixed to this. So it's very open language, very fact-based. It's noticing that these differences. It's optimistic at this point because we think, yeah, okay, we can see that we've got a difference here. Let's work out how to move forward. And so it's collaborative and there's a sharing of information. So as much information as necessary to find a, a, a way forward and it's rational. And in, by that, I mean, at this stage, we haven't, haven't got any, any emotions involved in this because it's not really something that requires emotions at this point. It's, oh, we've noticed there's a difference. How are we going to move forward? Now, if at this level we don't, we don't find that way forward or we ignore it, don't notice it, um, or we poorly manage it, we move to speed leads as second level, which he calls the disagreement level. Now, at this level... A and B, they still have the focus of that, that uh, issue that we talked about, but it becomes a little bit more personalized. So you can see that straight line between A and B, whether they're individuals or groups. Um, and so we start to see um, it, people making it more personal than rather than just on the issue at hand. And so at this stage, the outcome that everybody's focusing on is protecting themselves because they don't want to get that personal attack that they're starting to feel is, is happening. Now, at this point, the language shifts. So it becomes a bit more cautious, generalized. You always do that. You know, uh, you've done this before. It's always like this. And although the, the, the personalization aren't open attacks it is sort of subliminal a bit like using words with two meanings or a bit of hostile humor i was only joking but you've made your point and most of the people that may be in a meeting may have understood your point even though you've said just joking so there's a bit of tension because it's starting to become a bit personal and because you're trying to protect yourself you might not share all the information in case it's used against you. And most importantly, at this point, you will see that there's these little triangles, sorry, rectangles. That's called issue proliferation. Now, they may be things that are hanging over from previous uh, conflicts or engagements with the other party, or they may be something that is from one party's past 
where they've experienced something and they bring it's not been addressed or resolved and they're bringing it into this current conflict. So sometimes you might say something unintentional, but you get quite a big reaction from somebody. And it's often because there's a past issue. Nowadays, we would call that triggering, um, but it's because something hasn't been resolved from previous conflicts. So again, if we ignore it at this level and just hope it goes away or poorly manage it, we go up to the next level, the contest level. And it's interesting, it's a similar word from one of the C's, um, uh, a competition level. But it's a little bit different from uh, what's referred to in that equip to multiply um, that, that uh, Mark was referencing before. At this level, A and B stop talking to each other, but they do a lot of talking to others because the purpose at this level is to win. They want to get as much support for their side as possible. And so the language changes. They stop talking to one another and be, use exaggerated language, attacking the other to try and get support for their thinking, their, their whatever it is that they wanted to do down at level one. Now, although you uh, in your ministries might not be one of the parties, you might be, well, one of the people that's being triangled in. Did you know what B's done? They're always doing this. You know, I, I need your support. You need to tell B to do, you know, this, this, and this. We are often triangled into these situations. And this is where the blaming really starts to, to hone in on the other side. And then the last, the, almost the last level up to fight or flight at this level there is no uh, discussion or dialogue between a and b they are very much focused on their groups and at this level there's a very significant shift in what they're hoping the outcome will be is protection of group identity and what do i mean by that the language shifts quite a lot to an enemy image and it becomes ideological. By this, I mean that it becomes something much larger than what the whole thing was down at level one. So say, for example, at level one, a minister and whoever's in charge of music has a difference of opinion on what sort of music should be chosen for a, a service. Now, by the time it gets up to fight or flight, it's not about the music. It's about the fact that someone is suggesting something that is attacking the way we worship in our church or our theology or our culture or our way of life, if you want to look on a wider societal level. And this is an attack that needs to be stopped. And so this is where we get the enemy imaging on. In societal level, we're seeing it very, uh, very uh, vividly this week in terms of of people coming over on boats. They're going to, you know, they're going to take over. We won't be able to get hold of the NHS. Our jobs are taken. There's an enemy image there, but it happens in our churches as well. We need to stop B because they are attacking the way we we do we do worship, or it's putting under threat. Um, Christianity as we see it so it becomes quite intense and usually one of the two parties who's more conflict avoidant will decide this is just too painful I need to leave and you will have people or congregations splitting and the last level and then I'll stop is is the intractable situation at this level it's not enough that one of the parties wants to leave or bow out of this and that one of them has won. They want to destroy the other. Now, that sounds very dramatic. And in many of the places I've worked in around the world, which has been mainly in war zones, that has meant physically destroying somebody else. But in our context, it's often about destroying reputation. It's not enough that so-and-so has left. We need to make sure that um, what we think of them follows them for their days now just to be clear we're not talking about safeguarding issues where you do need to disclose uh, any issues that have come up we're talking about things that have come out of different ways of looking at things different theologies or so forth but reputational destruction is coming more and more frequent now as you go up these levels people lose trust in one another 
and they gain pain. So that it's much harder for us as mediators to be able to sort of bring people back down once you get into the higher levels. It's much easier if we can use good communication tools down here at problem to solve and disagreement than try and work through it. But if we do get up to the contest level, we would always advise bring in external people. And the reason for that is because nobody involved down here will be trusted enough to bring people back into the room and to have a fair process. Uh, otherwise, the whole purpose of external mediation is to be trusted for the process, not the outcome. The parties still need to find the outcome themselves, but they need to trust that the external mediators will be neutral and provide that fair process. Now, these things can happen very quickly. You can be in a meeting, a difference will come up, but by the time you've got home for the meeting, somebody's on the phone who wasn't there and tells you, I heard what happened. And that's because someone's gone home and, and rung somebody and said, do you know what's gone on? And suddenly you're involved in, in triangling. Um, I'm going to stop because it's a lot of information to take in. But I'm just wondering, as, as we're sort of just opening up a little bit, whether is whether people find there's a resonance there, they can see uh, when they've been in conflicts, how, how easily it can go to those levels. Uh, and if you have any questions, um, so I'm just going to stop sharing. I can put it back up if you wish, but so I can see people um, and just open it up. Does that resonate? Yeah. yeah. And one of the reasons we do that at Place for Hope is that if you can take a step back and think, oh, we're at level two, then in our trainings, we can provide the tools that think, okay, at level two, this is really what we should be focused on. Um, or if we get up to level three uh, or four, we really need some help here. Um, and so it does allow you to analyze where you are when it can be quite emotional and, and seemingly complex, because it often is with lots of people involved. Carolyn, I've just got a quick question on that, I suppose, is people about sort of scripture talks about gossiping and obviously go to the person and then obviously go to a three of you. Where do you see all that fitting into this? Okay, so one of the things with that, especially linked to that triangling thing is we all need, when, especially when we're in a conflict situation, we all need somebody to debrief with and to get some advice from. It's the intention with which you go to people. So if you've gone to, to somebody, to a, a spiritual director or a friend or a partner, I mean, it could be your wife, husband or whoever, and said, oh, this happened. What, you know, what do you think I should do? I'm thinking of doing this. That's very different from going to someone and saying, I oh, couldn't believe what this has happened today. Aren't they the worst? You're, it's a very different intention from getting that advice. Gossiping is in a sense triangling. It's, it's a little bit more subtle, but it's I'm in the group that is on this side. <laughs> so we are talking about people over there and you're othering them uh, rather than rather than saying well I, do I need to know this for a start and is there anything positive you know and if we are the ones triangled in what we advise people to do is say have you tried you know sitting down with them would you like me to sit down with you rather than take a side is do you need some help to sit down and talk this through have you tried this question to understand where they're coming from it's that sort of direction. I hope that helps. Yep. Uh, Carolyn, so. power is another dynamic in this, isn't it? Um, yep. Could you maybe just make, make some comments about yep. uh, the impact of power? Yeah. So, and then and, uh, I saw Chris has got your hand up. I'll come to you next, Chris. So one of the things that we often get called into <laughs> is to come and resolve something. And we have three layers of getting involved with conflict. One is conflict management. And, and anybody that's a parent or has been a teacher or somebody will understand conflict management is to separating the people so that it doesn't escalate and get worse. That's management that's sort of to prevent it escalating into worse situation. 
resolution is finding creative solutions to whatever the difference is that addresses the individual group's needs and interests in a way that they're both willing to go forward with. So it's, it's a very short-term process and it's very focused on the issue and the content. What we talk about Place for Hope is conflict transformation, which I referred to a little bit at the beginning. The focus of that is on relationships. And whenever we go into any situation of conflict, what we're also doing is not only understanding why people have different theologies, or opinions, or ways of doing things, it's also what are the power what's the power going on between the individuals? Is there an inequality here? Are there avenues for people to actually to say, this, there's a problem here, um, but because you're my boss or you're my minister or, or whatever the power dynamic is, I don't feel free to be able to share with you uh, what I'm thinking or feeling here. And so the structures, the power and the systems actually play into it. Now, it, if we're doing true conflict transformation, it's extra to just resolving whatever the issue that started this conflict, but looking long-term, how can we prevent these issues from continuing to arise? We have to look at the power dynamics in individual relationships and in the structures and systems of our communities. So if there's no avenue for somebody who is employed at a church or anywhere else um, to make to make a suggestion or a change, then that is going to continue to play into conflicts that arise. So power is incredibly important. And the other reason why mediation, once you get up into those higher levels, or having even having an informal mediator at the lower levels is important, is it puts both parties then on an even level because the process provides equal opportunity to speak. So that power dynamic is a little bit removed, um, although it's always present if people are thinking, you know, um, and there's a lot of power in churches that aren't in secular institutions. Um, they're more subtle often, often, and a lot of our volunteer roles are, are filled by people um, who, <laughs> who have a lot of soft power in the church, um, but and people are afraid of, if I challenge them, then the, the whole roster of this will go by the side and we'll lose them and, and it'll just be terrible. Um, so there's a lot of soft as well as, as, as firm power. So it's a really important dynamic if you want to transform conflict and the relationships and deepen community. But it's really just touching the edge of that. Yeah. Is that okay, Mo? Thank you. Uh, Chris. Carolyn, thank you. Where, where you presented that triangle, it seems the transition from the first level to the second level, where they move from being focused on a problem to it becoming personal, is, is quite a significant move. And the, and the other levels are just levels where that, that personal engagement becomes more and more detached and, and confrontational. Have you got um, any thoughts about, I guess it's two ways, it's how you try to minimize the movement from the problem to the personal or if you like where things are at the high levels press it back down to being more focused on the the, the issue at hand yeah so there's a couple of things and and uh, if i had all the time in the world i'd love to to go into all the different tools we use but i think I'd probably just focus on two things one is that is providing is setting up ahead of any conflict um what we would might call ways of working or code of conduct or whatever you want to call it in in in, in your own um, setup in terms of any group that meets together how do we want to behave with one another now it's it's rooted in in gospel values but to say that we, we, we respect one another is lovely as a value but it doesn't mean anything when people are starting to get emotional so if you have really clear and work through it ahead of time um, okay, when we don't shout at each other, we ask questions, we speak from the eye, all those sorts of things. And, and we, we work with whole congregations to develop those. It means that when, when you may be in a meeting where you see that there's a difference of opinion is 
if someone starts to become a little bit personal, oh, you always say things like that, or oh, oh, yeah, of course, you would be the one that brings that up. If it starts to go into that, we can remind one another that we all agreed that these are not the ways we speak to each other or that we give space to each other. And so it's not that somebody's coming in strong arming and saying you shouldn't talk to so-and-so like that. It's reminding us all of how we agreed we would we would be with one another, which is rooted in those gospel values, but put into very practical terms. But to do it once the conflict starts is much harder. You really need to work through a resolution of a conflict before you can then move to, to doing that. So having those set up is really helpful as sort of guidelines. Um, and the second thing is all of us can model how well we listen. We pause and listen before we react because so often as soon as we we hear things, we want to provide the, the other point of view and maybe asking some more questions. How did you come to that? And, and really the purpose is trying to see the other person as not the other, but as how can I find God in this other person who's driving me crazy? Uh, it may well be, um, but is I need to understand them better before I can even respond and it's it's taking that pause for me, and I'm just speaking for myself now. The only way I can I can deal with lots of those situations is to pause and remind myself I'm I'm secure as a beloved child of God. I don't always behave well, but at the end of the day, I need to react, act out of love, not react out of fear, fear that my my um idea or or way of thinking or way of doing things is going to be attacked here i need to be feeling secure to inquire from someone else why do you say that you know you, can you explain a bit more so they're all sort of culture things and the way we model um but i hope that makes makes sense yeah there's so much more i'd love to share with you. <laughs> yeah um yeah. And sometimes people at different levels, when we get called in, sometimes someone's still down at the disagreement level, not quite sure why someone's threatening to leave the church. Um, so all I said was sometimes often what we will hear and somebody, you go and speak to the other, other party and it's like you have no idea what's happened and they've got to be able to hear each other because they're at different levels um, altogether. <laughs> 